evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. We have an exciting talk planned tonight. Our speaker for the evening is Ralph Todd, and he'll be taking us all on an Antarctic adventure, where he will share his journey around the Arctic and the Falkland Islands, and also share some of the wonderful wildlife spotted while on the journey. If we have any time at the end, we'll be hosting a short Q&A. So if you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat below. I hope you enjoyed this evening, uh, the talk this evening, and I'll now hand you over to our speaker. Over to you, Ralph. Lovely. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. It doesn't seem three months ago that we were last with you talking to you about migration. So thanks for inviting us back. Uh, Brenda is just uh, reorganising the little bit of technology here so that we can uh, get into the talk. So yeah, three months ago, it was migration. Tonight, we're going about as far away as we can get to the Antarctic, a trip that Brenda and I have been, um, well, incredibly lucky to have done twice. We did it way back in the early 1990s on a small cruise ship uh, that was doing a round the world cruise. Uh, and we picked it up in Buenos Aires and left it in Punta Arenas in, in, in Chile. And it was a fantastic trip. It was over Christmas and New Year and it was organised by Wild Wings. So we were about 20 bird watchers on a cruise ship of about 200 people who some were interested, but most weren't. Didn't regret a thing about it at all, but I heard so much about South Georgia after that trip that I always wanted to go back to South Georgia. And in fact, we, we, we were able to do that a few years ago. And that's the subject of another talk, the South Georgia element. But we were able to see one or two other parts of the Falklands uh, and uh, Antarctic Peninsula that we hadn't previously seen. So tonight it's a combination of those two trips, one in early November and on a, on a small expedition cruise ship uh, and the other over Christmas and New Year. I'm sure there will be people watching, listening who have undertaken a, a similar trip to this or perhaps at least been to the Falkland Islands, which is part of this talk. The first trip I did, I was still working. I had a whole load of mates who were always envious of our overseas travels, but my secretary at the time did ask me whether we were going to see polar bears. Um, that made me realize that of all my efforts to try and enthuse, inspire and educate my colleagues in matters of wildlife, I'd clearly not quite succeeded because of course you only see polar bears in the Arctic and it's penguins we'll be looking at in, 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 the, in the Antarctic. She did also ask me if we were going, we would have an opportunity to go skiing, which uh, again, at that time I had to dissuade her of that, but I, I believe you can go skiing in Antarctic. You know, that's uh, opened up a little bit for other things other than just wildlife. Some might say that's a good thing. Uh, others might have a different opinion. But we're gonna concentrate our talk this evening really on the Antarctic Peninsula which is one of the longest of the peninsulas in the world, at nearly 900 uh, miles long. Um, but we are heading off from Tierra del Fuego, the little red spot that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, most southerly point in Argentina, uh, Ushuaia, uh, the furthest south town in the world. And we're gonna head off to the Falkland Islands, uh, which is about 230 miles to the east uh, of uh, the uh, continent of South America, then head down to the peninsula. One of the great things about going uh, down, flying down from Buenos Aires is that you actually get a good opportunity to uh, have a look at the, the, the southern tip of these magnificent range of mountains, the Andes Mountains, and we had a fairly clear flight which enabled us to, to see that. And that is a little bit of interest when we get down to the peninsula. But Ushuaia is a thriving town, a small city, I guess we'd call it, probably about 50,000 residents here. Uh, and it is the launch place for most of the expedition cruises that head down into the peninsula, the Falklands or South Georgia. Uh, fortunately, the larger cruise ships now don't go down that far south. There have been one or two incidents and concerns about the uh, heavy oils that these ships carry. So now it's mostly um, the, the, the expedition ships that uh, head down here with usually around about 100 to 150 uh, passengers, sometimes a few more than that. 
but you most uh, most people who visit here will have an opportunity to ha have a look around uh, the, the town have a whole day perhaps to have a look around before co collecting the ship in the early evening or, or late afternoon so it's always best to go to the local tourist office or the library to find out what's about from the local people they're a good source of uh, uh, knowledge to tell you what you might be able to do in your limited time there so we just did what we were advised to do, just have a little walk along what one would call a promenade, I suppose, uh, the, the, the road that runs along by the harbour area. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that the ship we're travelling on is the one in the background there, one of the Russian scientific ships. The Vavilov uh, is this particular one, which I believe is now out of uh, service. It's back with the uh, Russian scientific team. Uh, the one in the foreground, it pleased to say, was not ours, but it was a bit of a hub so for some wildlife. There were brown skewers spending a lot of time either sitting on that wreck or, or, or flying around it. Uh, and just along the shoreline, some classic birds, the, the blackish oyster catcher, uh, which was one of the sort of common birds along the shoreline, the rocky shoreline, uh, just away from the hubbub of the uh, town itself. And a, a gull that I, I, I find one of the most attractive looking gulls, the uh, dolphin gull, this uh, extraordinary coloration of this bird. We're used to seeing most of our gulls being white and black, but this one's just got some extraordinary uh, diffused colors from that pale gray into the uh, darker gray uh, mantle and uh, wings. As lovely as it looks, it, it is um, like a lot of our gulls, it's a, it's a scavenger. Uh, and it spends quite a bit of time marauding uh, wader colonies and smaller gull colonies. And here you can see one just on the edge of the town here, sort of having uh, pilfered this uh, egg from one of the local nests. So it's a bird that we you find across the Falklands and, and further, a bit further south. So you, you, you're with it for quite a while. Um, getting down onto the Falklands, this is another place you'll find the uh, the dolphin gull and about as far south as they go. Now the Falkland Islands uh, are a destination in themselves really uh, and on our second trip we were lucky enough to spend a few more days. Most of the uh, peninsula cruisers only spent two or three days here. We were actually spending about five days here on the second trip. On the right hand side you've got East Falkland with Stanley. Uh, the main town uh, and Volunteer Point just uh, above Barclay Sound there on the right and then on the left you've got West Falkland, the two main islands of the archipelago uh, with West Point Island right over on the north uh, west there or on the top left hand corner of the islands. There's about 700, 750 small islets and islands in the archipelago. Uh, they're about 145 miles from east to west uh, but West and East Falkland are, are the two main destinations. And we start off in, in, in Stanley, a rather colourful uh, community. There's only about uh, three and a half thousand people on, on the islands and most of those, about 2.8 thousand, uh, live in, in and around Stanley. And it's very British, as you might well expect. Uh, you, you, you arrive you're greeted with post boxes, post offices and telephone boxes. It's very, very British. The local pub is very British in its nature. And uh, Just walk along the street. You've got the governor's uh, house uh, there. You've got the uh, most southerly Anglican church in the world with, uh, I understand, the, the smallest Anglican community or congregation in the world with the uh, the, the, the blue whale uh, statue here which was built in 1933 I think it was to commemorate a hundred year, continuous years of British rule of the Falklands and then in the bottom left you've got the liberation monument to commemorate the ending of the conflict uh, back in the early 1980s there. Well we went out uh, on uh, trips to Volunteer Point uh, on our first trip we actually had to take four-wheel drives out from Stanley for about a three, half, three and a half, four hour drive across country. Uh, on the second trip, we were actually to, able to get in by ship and take Zodiacs uh, ashore. But it's a very, very interesting drive across the, the camp, as the, the locals call the outside, anywhere outside of Stanley is really called the camp or campsol. Uh, and even four-wheel drives can get stuck in it, as you can see the middle 
one here. Uh, it is very rough terrain and of course when we uh, went on both occasions we, we were aware that much of the landscape is still littered with, 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 uh, with mines and you there are certain areas you can and can't go so it's best to have local people with you. Even sort of taking advantage of getting four wheel drives out of their predicaments gives you the chance to, to look at some local bird life and uh, traveling overseas is always a challenge with identification, fairly not too bad on the Falklands, I think they've got a record list of about 165 but only 61 breeding species. But you still need a field guide but it's handy if you can at least identify the families so uh, three banded plover on the top and rufous chested dotrel on, on the bottom there would be two classic birds of the of the outdoors in this type of habitat uh, and very similar to the plovers and dotrels in in shy, size shape and uh, their behavior as those that we have in our own part of the world but we were going to volunteer point for for for, for, for three penguin species the falkland Play, plays host to five uh, five species of penguin uh, and we were lucky at Volunteer Point to be able to see three of them within fairly close proximity to each other. Uh, th this is just the beach area uh, of where we can see the the gentoo penguin uh, and this is just one of the ground well they're all ground nesting species of course because penguins don't fly but these are like the bare ground rocky dry bare, bare ground and these uh, a classic typical type of penguin around about 30 inches high they're one of the brush tail family you can see the the, the, the tail there very much uh, like a big brush uh, and like all penguins they're, they're colonial nesters uh, and this is just a, a typical part of their breeding colony that we found with the uh, with the Falkland sheep in the in the background there now much of the landscape here has been uh, developed for, for sheep. Um, the tussock grass that covers most of the islands originally has been burnt out to provide pasture for, for the sheep. But where you get this, this bare ground, uh, the, these uh, gentoo penguins will, will take up residence here. And they happen to move their colonies around about 150 meter, meters every year. And this particular area being uh, a very large privately owned farm. In fact, I think it's the largest privately owned farm in the Falklands. And the owners have taken the uh, opportunity to develop much of it as a nature reserve for the penguins. But the penguins give something back because all of this guano that they're depositing across this uh, area will make great fertilizer for future cultivation. And it works really nicely that the penguins actually move their colony every so often. So the farmer can use that um, land for, for rich cultivation. So here we've got a breeding colony of, of uh, gentoo penguins. Uh, they will have laid their eggs in, in October, early November, in er very early spring for them. Uh, so as a consequence at Christmas time, we were seeing fairly well developed young. You'll see something um, a little bit different when we get down onto the peninsula. They often lay two eggs, um, often hatch two young, but it's rare that both young will, uh, will survive. And the gentoo penguin is unusual amongst all the penguins and it, it actually looks after its young once they have fledged and gone off to sea with them. Most of the penguin family leave, feed their chicks really up to overweight size, then go off to sea themselves and leave the youngsters to develop, uh, uh, lose weight until they're so hungry that they are almost forced to go to sea and start feeding for themselves. But not the case with the gentoo. They look after their youngsters for a few weeks after they've fledged. The other species that we found sort of almost nesting cheek by jowl with the gentoo were, were the Magellanic penguins, uh, uh, but they can live side by side. They're both fairly inshore feeders, but their nesting requirements are quite different because the Magellanic penguins, uh, they, they dig a burrow uh, in the similar sort of soil uh, and uh, they, the, the sandy soil here. And they, they have these burrows that they they nest under. If you've ever come across uh, the African penguin or the jackass penguin or perhaps the Humboldt penguin in South America you'll probably re recognize that they they like shady places to, uh, to to nest. Well here there's not a great deal of shade so they, they've developed the idea of building burrows to nest in. 
And they, they, as I said, they nest almost in the same area near the same beaches. The beach is about two miles long, so there is plenty of space. Um, having said that, there's about 100,000 pairs of Gentoos nesting here. Uh, not so many Magellanics that, uh, in this area, but uh, they do nest cheek by jowl, as I say. They're a very attractive uh, penguin. As I said, they're very, very similar. If you've seen either the jackass stroke African penguin or, or the Humboldt, you'll notice that they are very, very similar in, in size, shape and coloration. I guess the most that we wanted to see, we knew we weren't going far enough south into Antarctica to see the, the, the largest, the, the emperor penguin, but um, we were wanting to see the king penguin. Uh, and the king penguin's doing pretty well uh, across its range. In fact, on South Georgia, it, it, where the largest populations are, uh, they're, they're increasing in number, as indeed they are on the Falklands uh, and here at Volunteer Point, uh, around about the same time as the family inherited or took over the farm here in about 1870 in the late 19th century, the king penguin was almost extinct uh, as a species. Penguins generally and king penguins in particular were much sought after by mariners uh, for, their, for their oil, for their meat and for their eggs. And indeed, eggs were still collected from penguins for food. Uh, until fairly recently on, on the Falklands. But this population was decimated um, until, even up until about the 1970s, there was only about 30 pairs here. Like, but I guess because of the protection uh, and the work that the, the owners have done, uh, there's now around about 1,500 adult um, king penguins here at Volunteer Point. And one of the things we were instructed on very, very heavily uh, as we were sailing from uh, Ushuaia down we, to, to, to the Falklands, we, we had many uh, lectures and talks. And one of which was that you must not go any closer than six meters or 20, about 20 feet to, to, to any of these uh, birds, these, these ground dwelling birds. Well, that's almost impossible because you can stop where you were 20 feet away, but nobody told the penguins that, the, that that's, the, that's the rule. So they will just wander around wherever they want and sometimes just walk over your, over your feet, if, uh, as you'll see later on. Now, again, in some old log books, ship's log books, they would talk about the woolly penguin uh, and clearly what we can see here. Uh, are the young uh, young king penguins, which to all intents and purposes do look rather woolly. Now the king penguin, they're all got little odd idiosyncrasies. The, the, the king penguin is the only one that can't complete its breeding season in, in a 12 month cycle. It takes about 14 to 15 months to, to raise and fledge uh, a, a young king penguin. So the, uh, the adults sort of produce one young every three to three and a half years. And you can see here the young ones molting that sort of fluffy, furry, feathery uh, plumage into their full plumage. And once the adults have finished their sort of breeding cycle with the youngsters, they will then undergo a complete molt of their feathers before then spending around about a year out at sea before coming back to shore to, to, to breed again. Hence that very long breeding cycle for one pair of, of penguin, king penguins. And like all the penguins, they, they, they tend to be monogamous, so they, they pair up and uh, come back. And you can see all of this molted feathering all over the ground. What you will find is that, uh, that there are different cycles uh, in the breeding season, so you'll see some fairly small uh, uh, of these species. But it's really uh, ungainly to see them uh, on the ground. The, these clearly aren't uh, birds that have been designed for life on uh, uh, terrestrial life. They're, they're so effective underwater, using those flippers to pr propel themselves underwater and the tails and the feet to steer themselves underwater like all penguins. Uh, and, you know, if you've got a scratch behind the eye or, you know, it can be quite a challenge to, to, to get at it. But see them underwater and then it's a different experience altogether. As we were wandering around looking at the enjoying the, the penguins we were very aware of, of these upland geese. Um, 
Uh, they reckon about six pairs of these geese will feed, use the same amount of grass for food as one sheep. So there's quite a bit of competition. The farmers are not that keen on too many geese being around. And one of the things we noticed down there, and uh, is if you think about the geese we have in the Northern Hemisphere, males and females to all intents and purposes are all identical. Whereas down in the Southern Hemisphere, many of the geese families, uh, the male and female are, are, are clearly very, very different. And talking of the upland goose, if you remember back to the uh, conflict, the Falklands conflict, uh, you will perhaps remember many, many BBC reports, Brian Hanrahan reporting from the Upland Goose Hotel. Well, that's how it got its name. Uh, it is no longer a hotel. We uh, understand it's now being converted into, into holiday cottages. So we set sail again. We'd left uh, Volunteer Point and we sail all the way around to, to West Point Island, uh, being accompanied on, on route by things like these giant petrels, huge birds of the albatross family around about a 10 foot wingspan, sorry, a two meter wingspan, weighing around about 10 pound in weight. And these, whilst the albatross family, that these are, well, the, the old mariners called them stinkers. These are the vultures, if you like, of the uh, Southern Oceans, uh, feeding on scraps, feeding on dead animals, carcasses. We found many of them on the shorelines feeding on dead seals or, 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 or even in one case de dead whales. So they're very much a vulture type animal scavenging. They will find their own food but uh, it's much easier for them particularly in these large groups that they move around in which again is unlike a true albatross because true albatrosses are very very singular in their oceanic movements. So we find ourselves at West Point um, family-owned farm again, uh, welcoming us uh, to, to, to their home to, to enjoy the bird life on the island, their garden birds, perhaps similar to ours, the Falklands thrush, uh, the long-tailed meadow lark, a family that you might be familiar with in America. This is a garden bird for them. And Limbalad uh, was the first person to go there in the 1960s uh, with Peter Scott and Roger Tory Peterson with a small group of tourists. And uh, from that day onwards, this family have welcomed people into their homes for uh, afternoon tea and cake, which is fine if you've got a small boat with about 30 people on board, as they did have with Limbalad. But a ship with uh, 120 people on is a different matter, but they still do it. They still welcome us. Uh, and uh, we're able to enjoy their hospitality, sitting having a cup of tea in the garden uh, with, with one of more of their garden birds, the re the, probably the most southerly raptor and one of the rarest raptors in the world, actually, the striated caracara, or you may know it as the Forster's caracara, but this is very much a garden bird. And unlike our raptors, which uh, fly away quite quickly, these are just happy walking around your feet uh, in, in the garden, striated caracara. So the idea of coming here is to walk across about a hundred, about a mile and a quarter over to the Devil's Nose, where they have a breeding colony of black-browed albatrosses. So we were very surprised when we got there on the first trip to, to find the Chorley District bus was there uh, to transport people who didn't want to take the walk. Um, they had this shipped in or helicoptered in so many years ago. I have to say, when we went back uh, most recently, that was in the back garden rusting away and it was four wheel drives that were taking people over. But we walked, it's a nice walk over to the Devil's Nose. And when you get there, um, the, the Falklands has, a, has the biggest, probably about two thirds of the world population of black browed albatross, about 400,000 pairs. Um, and there's over 2000 pairs just here on this uh, rocky oak slope down to the ocean and about 14,000 on West Point itself. So it's a very, very important area for black-browed albatrosses. And you can notice perhaps amongst them rock hopper penguins. This is a cliff face around about 300 feet high in the air. And we, um, we were surprised to learn that rock hopper penguins feed their young sort of couple of times a day. And they have to walk all the way down and then walk all the way back up this slope. Rock hopper penguins are, are, are cliff nesting. Uh, birds uh, whilst also being ground nesting of course but you can see the pretty uh, frustrated and fed up expression on some of the faces here as they begin that walk back down the, uh, the slope for about 250 feet uh, to feed their young uh, coming back up into the colony which is shared uh, with, with the black-browed albatrosses uh, 
These rockhopper penguins are part of the uh, tufted um, group of penguins, which also includes the macaroni penguin, which is the other one that nests on the Falkland Islands. Uh, they're very gregarious, they're always squabbling, uh, but uh, they seem to, to, to enjoy sharing this area with the black road albatross. And, but it was the black red albatross that we were really keen to see here. You, you, you can see the uh, rock hopper in the background, probably a little bit embarrassed because it is just such a wonderful pair bonding activity that these huge birds, the albatrosses perform. And those very large beaks are used so delicately The penguins turned his back altogether now, so embarrassed he is. Um, but so delicate, this mutual preening, bill clacking, uh, and then, as I said, this lovely mutual preening, these huge birds, um, so gentle and delicate with each other. They come back to the same nest mound uh, every breeding season. Uh, they're monogamous again, so they, uh, they stick together for well over 20 years, coming back, as I said, to this uh, same nest mound. When we were there in uh, November, uh, they were sitting on eggs. Uh, when we were there at Christmas, they were sitting on young and again this is almost a, a 12 month cycle from laying from coming back courtship laying eggs uh, hatching the eggs and, and fledging the young almost a 12 month uh, process they find it incredibly difficult to uh, just take off they can't take off like a garden bird they need to launch themselves off so you could be sitting gently as our guide here dick philby is looking out to sea, and suddenly these birds push themselves through the tussock grass which on much of the islands has been burnt down as i said to make way for pasture but uh, here it can be two three meters high uh, really tough grass that they'll push themselves through to come and uh, launch themselves up well he had the advantage of having a telescope to look through first in this occasion so he could see what the conditions were like out there before it launched itself off um, they they need the right wind conditions uh, launching itself off and i've seen quite a lot of photographs recently of black proud albatross off the yorkshire coast looking almost identical to this one but i can assure you that this one was actually taken off the devil's nose at west point island uh, in the falklands well, we achieved uh, the, the, the main objectives here and we are able to push ourselves off for a couple of day cruise across the notorious Drake Passage down to the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, and you can see that blue uh, arrow there is just pointing out the Antarctic Convergence. And this is quite a significant piece of ocean because it's where the southern ocean sort of wraps round into the South Atl southern Atlantic Ocean. And you get these cold waters coming up from the Antarctic, meeting the uh, Southern Ocean, the southern parts of the Atlantic uh, and the Pacific Ocean. So these warm waters mixing with the cold waters makes it an incredibly rich area for feeding seabirds, cetaceans and a whole range of other species. And you can actually feel it. They reckon it drops about two degrees in temperature over a half a degree of latitude here as we move down towards the, uh, the peninsula. And it's here that you notice, as soon as you go through that area, you notice a change in the species that you're seeing. You're seeing more cetaceans, more whales and dolphins. You're seeing more albatrosses, for instance, more of the uh, classic seabirds. So here we've got the gray headed albatross uh, coming along the side of the ship. You've got light mantled sooty shearwaters. I mentioned earlier that uh, all of the uh, uh, the, the, the albatrosses are colonial nesters, but they, they all spend the time at sea singularly. You don't see big flocks of albatrosses, but this is an exception. This one, uh, this one, uh, uh, this one doesn't it? breed in colonies. What is it? It's the light mantled sooty, Brenda was asking. Albatrosses. Albatross. Sorry, I said shearwater, didn't I? I always get sooty and shearwater together. I can't separate those two words. I probably see more sooty shearwaters than I do light mantled sooty albatrosses but this is the the big daddy of them all this is the wandering albatross uh, another of the circumpolar albatrosses these are incredible animals 10 foot wingspan huge huge birds the largest flying seabird in the world and how magnificent they are one of these has been radio tagged and was seen to travel 150,000 miles in 38 days uh, quite extraordinary. Another one, four and a half thousand miles in, in 13 days. 
they, they, they spend the first three years at sea and then another two or three years courtship display uh, before they settle down to breed in South Georgia, uh, raising their young. Just to give you an idea, I'm six foot two uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, a wandering albatross. So we're down on the peninsula now and we're going to, you can see four or five blue arrows there, top right at Hope Bay, our first border call, and then over in the left Deception Island, and then down through the, uh, the, the Gerlach Straits into the La Mer Channel, Port Lockroy, uh, and so forth. So we'll head on down. And it's always exciting. One of the great things that the, the captain of the ship and the staff get you to do is to somebody to shout when they see the first iceberg. There might even be a bottle of wine in it for the person who shouts for the first iceberg. But always exciting to, to, to get down there and see these mm. fantastic structures, which are absolutely enormous. You could be sailing past one of them for oh, a good you know, an hour or more. They're so huge. And then you see the uh, what the locals down there, the scientists who work down there, consider to be their swallows of the uh, the spring. Just as we the onset of spring and summer is brought to us by our swallows, the the daily penguins uh, who really enjoy these uh, ice flows uh, start to move onto their breeding grounds in, in early spring. And here you can see them just leaving the little ice flows demonstrating their ability to sort of porpoise through the air, they can fly underwater uh, and they move around about so at the same speed that we would perhaps have a fast walk or a slow jog depending on your fitness. And we're heading our first place to stop is Hope Bay which is an interesting place in itself, there's a, an Argentinian camp there uh, and as the first landing, you think, mm, well, that's uh, not quite as spectacular as I thought it might be as a nice flow of wandering across in front of the picture here. But, but then you realise that th this demonstrates how Antarctica Peninsula was at one stage connected perhaps to, to South America, the extension of the Andes and all of the fossilised plants and beetles that have been found here suggest that that is exactly, exactly the case probably separated about 30 million years ago. But when you look even closer at this and you get closer to this, uh, you realize that that's not all just dark mountainside. When you look lower down, you suddenly realize that you're confronted with the most amazing numbers of daily penguins, just all over the lower parts of that mountain range, Mount Flora in Hope Bay there. Well, you'll be pleased to know that this is not how you get onto a zodiac to get into the water. That's just one of the drivers bringing one down for us to walk down the, uh, the, the steps or the pontoon onto a zodiac. Now, this can be quite tricky, uh, depending on the swell uh, that around the ship. They, uh, they, they, they are very careful at what point you do get on and off the ship. They won't allow you on and off if the swell is too much or it's feared to, to be too much that they will readjust the program. This is the first ship we went on. You can see it's a larger one than the expedition ship. But you're always under the control of a guide, um, very, very disciplined. The whole access and tourism business to Antarctica is governed by treaties, uh, which all operators have to conform to. Um, not more than 100 passengers ashore at any one time, and you have to go on guided routes, specific routes. But as I said, that doesn't stop the penguins coming to you if that's what they want to do. But what a fantastic backdrop these animals have. The daily penguins, probably the classic uh, of the penguins, again, similar to the Gentoo in, in size, shape and uh, family, the brush tails, huge colonies. Again, laying two eggs, often raising two young, uh, not always two succeeding. And as you can see here, they, they feed them up to the maximum um, before the adults disappear off to sea uh, to engage in their normal life, leaving the youngsters to, uh, to, 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 to fast, if you like, until they're so hungry they go ashore. Beautifully designed for underwater uh, living. Uh, the, 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 the aerodynamics of these birds are incredible and they have special glands to exhale the, the salt that they obviously intake through the uh, spending so much time under sea water. 
But this is what I was talking about. You just lay down. You can see here I've got all the gear on, wet, warm weather gear. Uh, I've discarded the telephoto lens for a for a normal small telephoto lens, and just watching the, the the birds come and go. And we were fascinated that these birds were just walking past us down to this stream or small rivulet, uh, crossing that uh, and watching them sort of really determinedly go across this stream until they get to this area of snow on this slope here. And we realised that whilst we were all togged up in all sorts of gear. It was a relatively warm afternoon. It, it does get just above freezing down there, uh, relatively warm, um, but for them it was too warm. Uh, that, that, so we, we generally think they were cooling off on this slope, as you can see them walking up and then just skiing down almost. And uh, it was great fun to watch the Adelie penguins here. And you can see here just a, a little bit of it, the one on the left, not sure whether it's a male or female because there is really no way of telling the difference between the two but she's clearly been sitting on eggs or, or looking after a youngster a little bit scruffy dirty whereas the other one that's been at sea fishing comes in pristine and clean so we head off down further south down the peninsula when you're a group of birders as we were on the first trip we, uh, we, we we took it in shifts because it's getting towards 24 hours of daylight down there. You don't want to miss anything. So a lot of sleep was taken on board uh, during the day. If there was nothing particularly happening, somebody would be looking out somewhere, make sure we didn't miss anything. Deception Island or Pendulum Cove. Um, the, uh, the, the This area here is a volcanic crater uh, inlet here. And we're going through some ice flows here. The peninsula is generally uh, free of ice pack or pack ice, but much plenty of ice, small ice flows, which we had to sail through in November. Uh, lots of crunching and cracking as we went through. And then when you get ashore, you are reminded of, uh, of the past of this area, Pendulum Cove, uh, was a whaling station. Um, way back in the early 20th century, the Norwegians and then the Brits and the Dutch and others would have been down here. And on this particular shore, uh, you're, you're reminded of uh, the activity, about 150 men were working down here at the, at the peak of the whaling, 34, 35 ships, whaling ships down here uh, and producing a huge amount of whale meat and blubber and oil um, through these huge, um, through these huge um, industrial um, pieces of equipment here. Because it's volcanic, it is an opportunity. There are warm water flows here and it is an opportunity for those who want to, to say they've been swimming in the Antarctic Peninsula. Well, good luck to them. That's what I say. There was quite a bit of flu and cold after that. The rest of us, well, the bird watching crew went off to see what we could find. And there is plenty to find. This is the Weddell seal. Um, Plenty of those around, got a large species of seal. Uh, these get as far south as any mammal on earth. These can be found down as far south as the South Pole, further than any other mammal. And the penguins again, a different one, uh, a new one for us. We've added a daily penguin since we've been on the peninsula. And now we add the chin strap and these two penguins will go hand in hand. They both like uh, these ice free, um, islands and areas. Uh, I, like, I quite like this one. It's almost a hear no, see no, speak no if, you'd, uh, if they'd use their flippers more effectively. But they are a, a cracking little uh, penguin. Again, it's similar size to the Adelie, uh, slightly smaller than the Gentoo. And you can see this one is doing what a lot of penguins do when the temperature does get that just a little bit too warm for them. They, they get rid of the heat through those few bits of fleshy uh, material they've got on their under their flippers uh, and on their on their webbed feet. Uh, they've got webbed feet, but they don't use them. Um, they use them for steering mostly, not for not for propul propulsion. But that you'll see it again later. This is what they do to get rid of some of that heat from their bodies. But in November, it wasn't always that warm. Um, we also had some pretty extraordinary conditions um, down there. There's still a lot of snow coming in and we were sitting off here just watching this large um, colony of uh, chin strap penguins. This is Bailey's head with about 200,000 pairs here, one of the most important colonies and largest colonies uh, on the peninsula. 
and they're all marching backwards and forwards. Some of them are clearly uh, coming in and going out from the water, very dirty, some are very clean. And it was interesting to sit and watch them because they were very, very wary about coming into the water. And it wasn't because we were there, we were well off and we were looking at different areas and they were very cautious. But once the first ones got in, then they all piled in together and it was quite amusing to watch them. But we realised why they were being so cautious, because one of the main predators of the uh, penguin colonies down here is this animal, the leopard seal. And it is not a particularly good looking animal, it's a ferocious animal. And along with the killer whale or the orca, these are the two main predators, not only of uh, penguins, but uh, these all have a go at other seals, the, uh, the crab eater seal in particular. Something else we found as we were walking along the beach uh, on Pendulum Cove was uh, the uh, snowy sheath bill. Not a particularly pleasant bird, this one. It's not a great looking bird in itself, but when you realise that it spends most of its time sort of wandering around in amongst uh, seal poo or penguin poo, picking around there, um, you realise you don't want too many of them on the boat um, or the ship uh, as you're sailing along, but they are a notorious for hitching lifts on, on ships. And indeed, many, many years ago, some of you might remember one turned up in Plymouth on, on a ship. So they are, they, they're, they're very good at um, cadging a lift, but not something you want around too much. They're, they're, but they're there, they're quite a common bird on the islands, particularly around these penguin colonies and, and any seal colonies. So we're much further south now. We're coming down towards Port Lochroy. Uh, uh, down in Culverville, um, two of the destinations that uh, many of the ships go to. Uh, and this is actually in November when there's still a huge amount of snow around and you'll see a contrast in a moment when we see this same colony in the uh, Christmas New Year period. But now th th they don't like this. As I said, when we were up in the Falklands, they prefer sort of the dry stony areas and their nests really are made just of a few stones like the Adelies. They just pick up a few stones and that's the cause of most of their squabbles, pinching each other's stones to, to build their nests. So they're all wandering around at the moment, just gathering together, keeping their couples together, keeping their pair bonding together. We went ashore here and we had the most incredible blizzard um, uh, fortunately our guide knew exactly where we were going and it didn't last long but it just shows you what can happen uh, in a very short space of time uh, and we got to the colony uh, uh, and it's almost a case of it's behind you isn't it you know there, there's one just standing here looking at us but already even in these bad conditions for the penguins and they're used to these conditions of course uh, this is how they spend much of their life but um, they're, 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 they're they're really battling against the elements here. We're, we're doing the same, trying to photograph them as best we can. But that pair bonding, courtship display, even copulation was taking place in, in those harsh conditions of early spring, early November, October to March is the spring summer period. Now, this is the same site in um, it, it, Christmas and New Year um, when we were down there. So the Breeding cycle here is much later than it was in the Falklands and South Georgia. Here, they're still sitting on eggs um, at this time. They would have laid their eggs late November uh, and uh, they're now incubating those eggs. And these Gentoos down here really get a bad deal because they're sitting in a fairly large colony, not only of Gentoo penguins, but higher up the cliff uh, on the rocks are, are blue-eyed shanks or imperial cormorants. And they're squirting all their guano all over the place. So you'll find this is a really smelly, mucky, wet, dirty area just to be walking around, let alone sitting, incubating eggs. And we were lucky enough to just sit there. We were sitting on a rock watching these uh, birds uh, and we actually sat there as an egg was hatching right underneath the, 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 this adult here. And you can see little tiny chick coming out of the egg there. Uh, and just here a couple of little chicks. So we're nearly two months behind where we were in, in, in the Falklands. And there's another one just coming ashore looking very pristine uh, as it's come back to the colony. 
traveling around between ship and shore is usually done by zodiacs like this uh, and uh, there's always opportunities you never know what you're going to see crabby to seals you very rarely see the crabby to seal on land uh, these are nearly always on ice flows on ice pack uh, and these very small areas they're very rarely on land this is supposed to be the most um, abundant seal in the world um, huge population of them but this one, it shows you some of the dangers they face. Uh, they're, they're, they're smaller than the Weddell seal. Uh, so they're prone to attack from the leopard seal that we saw earlier and orcas. Some of the seabirds that will just be drifting past you, you've got broad-billed prions, you've got, uh, the, the left there, you've got uh, the Antarctic petrel, uh, the right here, along with the Cape petrel or the Cape pintado. Uh, the the, the multi-coloured one or the multi-brown and white one. Cape Pintado is one of the former family again. It's got that tube nose that you, you, you're familiar with, with our own northern former. And these go around in colonies, uh, moving around, pecking up if they find anything on the surface, they'll all gather together. Talking about gathering together, this was the expedition crews when uh, even under whatever conditions, they, they try to have at least one or two barbecues on deck um, in, the, in the cold of November. It was uh, quite good, good fun. Well, very good fun. We we're all supposed to dress up in silly hats and to keep ourselves warm. And if, you're, if, you, if you want ice for your gin and tonics, well, there's no shortage of that, of course. So uh, you can always pick a piece of that up on the way back to the ship when you're coming back on your Zodiac. Just by complete contrast, the, the Wild Wings group went down in 1992 and we had to, we took stuff for Iguazu Falls for the normal Antarctic trip. And then we then we um, did uh, uh, the, the, the full dress thing for dinner in the evenings. And th this was just Christmas and New Year. Typical cruise ship um, di dining here, unlike the expedition ship, which is good wholesome food, but uh, not of this quality and this was us a few of us about two o'clock on new year's day having had a very very good new year's eve uh, just enjoying the uh, the twilight but the main focus of this was really trying to get into the Le Maire channel uh, and we had three attempts on our first trip uh, back down in 92 we had three attempts to get in here because there was so much of this ice flow it was very difficult to uh, maneuver that size of ship down here uh, and on the third day of attempting it, we actually managed it, which was uh, fantastic. Um, New Year's Day, new opportunities. Everybody was excited to see if we could get down into that channel there that you can see in front of. Well, most people were. Some people were still rather hung over from the night before. That's one of our good friends. He, it's not me, just because he's got a beard. It's not me. But this was where we were heading, down into the La Mer Channel. It really is um, considered to be the most beautiful of the offshore channels. And we got down there and we just found ourselves totally surrounded by ice uh, and mountains of snow. It was just an extraordinary experience. These little ice flows, mini icebergs going past and you can see the sort of 80% of them are under the water and the lovely different color blues. And we were hoping to get over to Peterman Island, which they sent the crew out um, to, to test the uh, sort of conditions. Uh, and they came back, sadly, to say that it was not um, suitable for us to get ashore. Um, so we, we just sat there for a little while and then we had to turn around the ship round and go back. Um, as you'll see in a moment, when we went back the second trip, we were able to get to Peterman Island. But just sitting here waiting for this uh, little expedition team to go off, just gave us an opportunity. Most of us, most people were under, under the deck doing all sorts of entertaining things, but the bird watchers stayed on deck all the time. And it's very, very difficult to, to explain, to, 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 to invoke the, the feeling of silence, of wilderness, of just nothing. There was just a slight whir of a radar on the ship, but other than that, there was not a sound. Uh, and it was just a wall of ice and snow. And it's one of those, things you can't describe but will live with me forever that leaden sky um, I think we probably don't get those sort of skies now we don't get the snow that we used to get but the only thing I can equate it to is 1962-63 I remember going outside on that 
first night of that terrible snowstorm. That was all I can equate. Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable. And we stood there and just one of the most beautiful birds just drifted past the snow petrel. Now this one is, uh, it, this lives right up on the top of the Antarctic um, mainland, 3000 feet up, stunning little bird that uh, really lives in the most hostile conditions along with the emperor penguin and the adelie penguin who also live right down in the antarctic mainland all the other penguins live between the antarctic um, circle and, and capricorn this is a bird that may be familiar with you this is the antarctic fulma very very similar to our own northern fulma you can see all the features there and that tube nose and just stunning scenery. These are the uh, towers um, that you pass as you go into the La Mer Channel. And the place we retreated to when we couldn't get into the La Mer Channel, including some other little excursions, we went back to Paradise Bay. And this is a place we went back to also on the second trip. And whoever called it Paradise Bay knew what they were doing because it's a, a relatively shallow bay, um, but surrounded by the most stunning scenery um, this is November, um, it's still a lot of snow uh, down there on the ship, as you can see. Um, but just to be there and to enjoy these icebergs and these ice flows drifting past the ship was just magnificent. And this, you stand there and you just let your imagination sort of drift away with it. I, I saw the Sydney Opera House here, I don't know why and what other people saw in it. Uh, this one, I, I had some sort of prehistoric animal or some. Um, so with the backbone running along it uh, and this one I, I we, we were chatting about these things because there was whales in this bay as well and I just said that sort of reminded me of this white grand piano sliding off the Titanic which was probably not a very good analogy given where we were and what we were on but um, and that one I, I had as a, initially as an arrowhead going right, but then somebody said, no, it's a swan going left. So uh, you can allow your imagination to do all sorts of things. And if you can see one little black smudge at the right hand end near the water of that uh, piece of ice, that's actually a Wilson storm petrel, which of course people get very excited about here. Uh, and they were just dancing uh, around these little ice flows. Presumably the ice flows were disturbing some form of insect life, invertebrate life onto the surface. And of course they get their name Petrel from St. Peter walking on the Sea of Galilee as they, they dabble, they tread along the surface of the water there. And as I said, there were whales, there were humpback whales, minke whales, uh, Whales uh, have, have suffered enormously um, in, in, in this area, in the Southern Oceans, up until really the, the Second World War. And then things did start to change with uh, the International Whaling Commission setting moratoriums. So whale populations are returning and we're just sitting there, as you can see, we're not moving. We've cut our engines and just letting the whales do what they want to do. And this one was feeding actively. Most of them feeding on this little creature. The krill, um, one of the shrimp family, and the penguins, most of the penguins, and the, the uh, huge animals that are the whales feed on this tiny little crustacean. And we also saw orcas, um, the, uh, the population of orcas in the, in the Antarctic are a different race to those in the uh, northern waters, but we, we had a couple of pods of those whizzing past us. And then, uh, as I said, we did get to Peterman Island, which were, is a spectacular ending to, to the tour because it is the ending of the uh, southerly cruise down through the Lemaire Channel and along the peninsula. Uh, just to spend an afternoon here, which we were able to do amongst all the uh, penguins and, and in this case, the, uh, the, 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 <coughs> the blue-eyed shag or imperial cormorant, as some might know it as. These are extraordinary in that they, they, they lay their eggs and they have their chicks. And these are the only chicks, I think, born without down. These seabirds don't have any down at all. So totally relied on the adults for keeping them warm until uh, they're quite a few days old. And then just to finish up again with the two of the favorite penguins of, of the trip, the, the Gentoo in, in sort of the lower quarters here uh, and the Adeli in the uh, sort of penthouse looking down on everybody. These, these 
penguins able to cohabit. I said there's a lot of squabbling going on because of the, uh, the, the, the nest material that they take from each other, which is these pebbles. But beyond that, it, it's just fantastic to, to have that opportunity to just sit as we were doing at Peterman Island just for an afternoon to finish up the trip and just sit and just watch what was going on. Quite, quite an extraordinary um, scene, as I'm sure you'll agree. The scenery around here was absolutely fantastic. This is uh, Paradise Bay, heading back north to Paradise Bay. These huge sort of sea cliffs of ice and snow. Um, that's uh, the, the wilderness that is, is Antarctica. Uh, just a fantastic experience and something we're just so pleased that we've been able to do and experience that, uh, that extraordinary place that is Antarctica. But we had to come back, back through the Drake, Drake Passage. We've been lucky, we've heard some horrendous stories about the traveling across these oceans, but we were relatively lucky. We had one rough half a day, but uh, it can be pretty rough. Uh, and, and back to, to Ushuaia, not all of the cruisers go back to Ushuaia. Some of them go to one or two other South American destinations, but uh, this particular one returned to Ushuaia for a very long flight back by Buenos Aires to, to, to London. So thank you once again for in, uh, inviting us back. I, I hope we've been able to touch uh, a few elements of our experiences and our adventures down in, in Antarctica. And uh, thank you very much for watching. I think you can now go and have your own uh, refreshments or cups of tea or whatever you would like at this time of night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Right. Uh, the images are just amazing. I imagine that the, 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 the just mirror just an inch of what the actual experience was like. The scenery, everything looks fabulous. We've had lots of comments coming in. Uh, lots of people love the talk, amazing photos, and glad to see you back as well. And we do have some questions as well. <laughs> we do have some questions, uh, so we'll go through um, as many as you're happy to. Yeah. Uh, big mix of questions as well, some about the journey, some about some species. So, um, where to start? Okay, so. Uh, from this is from Annie. She's curious to know how penguins are around people. Are they skittish animals, or are they used to being observed? Yeah, that's a good question because that is clearly one of the threats. If you want to look at it in, in conservation terms, um, tourism is a potential threat to that area. A huge amount of scientific work going on at all sorts of scientific stations, the Brits, the South Americans, the Americans, doing all sorts of studies. Uh, British Antarctic Survey, of course, doing big, big studies on whole things like climate change and uh, the species. But there is also a lot of research going on about tourism and the impact it's having. And because to get ashore, you've got to land on a beach. Uh, and penguins being penguins, their favoured habitat are, are beaches uh, and sites close to beaches. So that, that, that is a potential threat. Um, and it is something that is controlled. It is something that is governed by the treaty I briefly mentioned uh, earlier on. All the tour operators and the cruise operators from all over the world who go down there. And tourism is increasing, there's no doubt about it. Um, they work to these terms and conditions. So you won't get three or four ships turning up at the same place at the same time if it is a larger ship. And as I said, in the early days when you could get ships of up to about 500 people down there, they weren't all allowed ashore at the same time. Um, now, I don't think ships of that size are allowed down there, but uh, most of the expedition ships are around about 100, 150. And access points to those sites is looked at carefully to make sure they're not disturbing or giving undue disturbance to the penguins. You can never guarantee where the penguins are going to be, but as I hope I was able to demonstrate, just by sit, going ashore where you're allowed to go, sitting where you're advised to sit instead of just wandering all over the place or going for a two mile hike, um, you can just get so much benefit from just sitting and watching because those animals will come to you uh, and Literally, I didn't show pet photographs, but I've seen photographs of penguins literally walking over people's legs and uh, and, and th they walk within feet of you. And that's so to answer the question, if they're respected, I don't think they're bothered too much by it. We have quite a bit 
big question here. Um, did you see any effects of climate change and global warming while you were there? What time of year did you visit as the ground looks quite bare? Yeah, um, we visited in early November and uh, sort of mid-December to early January. Okay. I, I haven't visited often enough to be able to give that comparison myself, really. It would be unfair to, to say I could. But because I have a love of the area, I do follow articles and not hugely scientific papers, but as much as I can read. And it is interesting that one of the things that is happening is because so much of this glaciation is melting, there's more fresh water going into the ecosystem than salt water. So one of the problems at the moment, ironically, is the pack ice seems to be increasing in some areas because of the fresh water. And the impact of that is there was a colony of daily penguins of 18,000 dailies, and they only reared, I think, a couple of hundred young. And the reason put down to that is because they were having to walk much further across the pack ice to get to the, the, the open water to feed. And they just weren't able to feed the young enough to sustain them. Scientists think that that will actually change eventually, that, um, that things will go back to something like normal. But it seems to be so dynamic at the moment. It's changing very quickly. Um, when I talk about quickly, we're not talking about hundreds of years now, we're talking in five and ten years, things are changing down there, whereas it was much slower. So I didn't see it myself, but we know that it is having an impact. One of the things that has had a big impact around the Falklands and between the Falklands and Antarctica is overfishing, of course. That's um, one of the big problems, and that is beginning to be resolved, particularly with, with albatrosses, these wonderful techniques that they're developing with hook pods and things like that with the albatrosses they're, 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 they're being able to eliminate a lot of the bycatch and uh, the, the, the decimation of uh, albatross colonies through overfishing and through being caught on fishing lines but climate change is clearly having an impact but I haven't visited regularly enough to personally have seen it myself um kind of going off from that did you get the opportunity to contribute in any way however small to ecological research or citizen science or to meet any scientific professionals working on the continent <laughs> uh yes is the answer <laughs> because as i alluded to in answers to the first question there are a huge there's a huge amount of research going on down there and i can't remember the two sites way back in 92 we were we were gathered together by a team to be talked to and to give feedback. And the same thing happened on the most recent trip, another different site. We, we were engaged with some scientists, actually contributing to sort of survey data and that sort of thing, no, but um, in being, well, you, you're being educated on the ships anyway, because there's people on board ships talking to you about all sorts of things from birds to, to the marine life, to the environment and the conservation issues. Uh, so you're getting the messages on, on the ship. But certainly I recall one landing that we went where a group of us were invited to, to participate in a sort of Q&A session and uh, give feedback. Um, some questions on your journey now. So, were there any predict? <laughs> getting the word out. Were there any predictably mundane moments that turned unexpectedly into one that you'll cherish forever? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose one mundane. Uh, you can't. There's lots of things you'll cherish forever. I remember being stuck in my cabin for 36 hours because Brenda had been rather ill and looking at Elephant Island out of the porthole of the, the ship and thinking this is where that man Chapleton, who was one of the reasons I wanted to go to, to, to South Georgia to follow in his footsteps to some extent and to look out on a foggy day at Elephant Island and just thinking I've just come from South Georgia. And this guy did this in this little tiny boat with some of his fellow seamen. And I, you know, you, 
trying to put that history into the modern day context or it was something quite extraordinary. But there are, there are, there are, there are, there are too many, um, to, to, every, every experience, even just sitting on the ship for two days over the Drake Passage, hoping that you're not going to get seasick, it is <laughs> something you, <laughs> you, you, you think about. The albatross. But albatrosses, uh, yeah, I can understand why people get excited with uh, albatross at Bempton Cliffs and we drove within 50 minutes of it the other week and I still didn't go and see it, perhaps I should have done, but um, to, to be in the oceans with not a single other ship in sight and have these huge birds just drifting around you with lots of little ones, prions and petrels flying around as well is something that you never experience in the northern hemisphere. Um, Maybe you've answered that in that question then, but did you have any bucket list sightings while you were there? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we have a question and it says, what's the, this is from Anne, what's the trick for keeping warm in such a cold place? <laughs> Layers. No, thermal <laughs> underwear. Layers. <laughs> Layers. <laughs> and uh, on the first, some of the, some of the, companies give you a sort of thermal coat those red coats that we had on the third first trip with the logo of the ship on it I have to say I took back on the second trip because that was so mm. feather downy warm um, even though it wasn't the logo of the company we went through the second time they weren't going to give us a, a, a coat so we took our own um, but layers uh, was it and that that, that was the Again, the expedition ships are a little bit better because they have things like Wellingtons and over trousers, warm over trousers. Uh, if I if I did the longer talk, I do I do this as a sort of eighty minute talk with an interval, and if I do that, I do show some of these things, uh, like having to wash your hose your footwear down every time you go off and come back on the ship. But they've got a huge area with all these uh, clothing stuff on there that you can use um, if, if you haven't got your own but certainly on the first trip as I said we went we did a pre-tour to Iguazu Falls so it's she shorts and t-shirts um, normal birding gear then we needed Wellington boots over trousers thermal underwear um, big thick jumpers then a dinner suit and uh, <laughs> packing for that was uh, it was a bit bizarre uh, but yeah uh, just layers really but you saw me laying out there when I was photographing the Adelie penguins. I'd still got the over trousers on, the Wellingtons on, because they can be pretty mucky places as well, you know. So you, um, you, you, are best sort of with as much of that sort of protective gear on, uh, which also works is um, warm as well. Uh, but otherwise, you know, you can always if you're if you're on the ship, you can always go in and get a cup of hot chocolate or something and bring it back. And, you know. <laughs> Maybe a hot toddy. <laughs> well, indeed, yeah. indeed. No, <laughs> taking your name in vain. <laughs> Oh, well, um, that's everything for the questions. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for the kind of the good one. Thanks for the questions. Yeah, They're nice. Yeah, nice to have good. that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone does have any more, please email them into us and I'll pass them on um, to Ralph and Brenda. Um, but I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the Trust. It was a really interesting talk this evening and um, I look forward to having you again in the future, hopefully. Yeah, good. Well, thanks for inviting us. Nice to uh, see you all virtually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, just one last message from me for everyone. And um, we do have our list of online talks uh, for the winter all online. So you can see that by visiting www.lrwt.org.uk forward slash uh, online talks. And we have them all open until January at the moment. Hopefully we'll add on more for 2022 as well. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Again, thank you, Ralph and Brenda. Um, yeah. And I'll see you next time. Lovely. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.